the second part of this session. Next speaker will be David Tanner, and he'll talk about control of multi-electron dynamics in higher mode generation under the assumption that he will manage to get his computer. Several years ago, with the uh, with a graduate student named uh, Asaf Shemshevich, the theoretical methodology, which we developed to solve the time-independent Schrodinger equation, and a postdoc Norio Takamoto, who is now at the uh, Max Planck Center uh, in uh, Postdoc in Korea, uh, developed extended this to the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, and two current postdocs, Shan Mahnes, who's here and Eli Asimov and a new graduate student of El Alta have, have worked on this. And uh, it's, it's, what I want to really focus on is, is methodology. I know that uh, for the experimentalists to hear a talk about theoretical methodology is about as interesting as for me to hear a talk about, uh, about experimental apparatus. But I'll try, to, I'll, try to, I'll try to focus on the physics of the methodology and why I think it really is a new paradigm and could be really useful for the kinds of problems that I think are of interest to the people in this room. So it's a method which is inspired uh, by classical mechanics, but it's a fully quantum mechanical method. Uh, and we're trying to use it now for, um, for multi-electron uh, problems. And so far we have results for one electron uh, in a strong field. Uh, and preliminary results on two electrons in a, in a strong field. And what we'd like to do is to get this really working now in, in, uh, uh, more extensively and then combining this with uh, optimal control methodology, which we heard a lot about in the Christiana's talk uh, yesterday. And here in green, I call, I, we call this thinking inside of the box. And you'll, you'll understand as, we, as I go on in the talk with the methodology why we call that. So here's a, uh, a, a typical strong field process, the famous uh, three-step mechanism with uh, tunnel ionization, uh, essentially free electron motion, and then, and then recombination, high harmonic generation, and so forth. And, and this picture, which is a very good, which is a classical picture, uh, goes quite a long way for describing the features of the, of the harmonic spectrum. And, and there's been work to try to turn this into a, a, a more rigorous quantum mechanical description. But what I want to do is, is talk about actually a fully quantum mechanical way to do these kinds of calculations that, uh, that, that still captures the underlying classical mechanics. And uh, here's another uh, system which I think is very familiar to this audience. Uh, concerted versus sequential double ionization in, in helium. And we see here this famous uh, knee structure in the uh, double ionization. And uh, here's a quote from Lambropoulos' very extensive review article uh, in 98. Uh, the status of helium under strong short pulses of long wavelength, uh, this is the status most likely its behavior is basically compatible with the idea of collision. It would be nice and reassuring to have someday an ab initio Two electron approach. I'm not somebody who spent uh, much of my career working look, looking at electrons at all. But when you're trying to, to get into a new field and you find out that, that the two electron problem isn't solved, uh, it's, 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 it says, well, there's a lot to that, that can really be done here if it's possible to develop uh, some new methodology. <clears throat> So, so two active electrons a still unsolved problem. And this is again is from Lambropoulos. As the writing of this article, there is no well-established and tested general approach to the non-perturbative solution of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation with two active electrons. Now, to this was in 1998, but I, uh, my, my conversations with people in this field indicate that, 
that there have been improvements, but, but it's not, there hasn't really been a major breakthrough. And these statements are still relatively true. Uh, so why, why, why are two electrons interesting? It's such a simple system. Uh, well, actually, let me, maybe I'll start with, 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 these, kind of, with these kind of considerations. Uh, in fact, I call this jokingly the hydrogen atom of multi-electron systems. If you're looking for something beyond one electron systems, this is the simplest possible paradigm for, a, uh, for going beyond one electron system. And um, now there, there's, uh, uh, there's work that goes back many years with <laughs> back many years um, about doubly exciting states of helium and planetary models of electron motion. And, and so you can think about the electrons as, as moving uh, in, in, in almost kind of molecular vibrational kinds of ways, double symmetric stretch, anti-symmetric stretch, uh, bending motions like this, an in inner, in, in, a, a inner and an outer one and so forth. And one can think about, about more general types of motions that involve uh, trying to control correlation and entanglement and, and so forth. And so, so if you think about all the possible motions of the three-body system, well, this is, there's a vast number of things that, want, that can happen. And we would like to really see if we can ultimately control these types of motions and then, and then hopefully interact with the experiment. Because it's a fairly, it's a simple system, the Hamiltonian is completely known, we can propose new experiments and hopefully get the interest of, of uh, people in this room. Uh, so here's some things you might want to control. Novel correlated two electron states. Control of, of concerted versus sequential double ionization. In other words, uh, can we, by changing the laser pulse, can we, can we get the uh, double ionization to be sequential? Or can we get it to be, to be truly concerted as opposed to through a kind of a recollision mechanism? And can we enhance or suppress high harmonic generation? So this is kind of a diagram of what we want to do. We want to figure out how to solve the time-dependent Schrodinger equation of two electrons in a strong laser field, take our tools from quantum control theory, and put it together and try to control two electron dynamics in a strong laser. Okay, so now let me tell you about the, the methodology that we're, that we're uh, developing. And the methodology is based on, on the, the, the classical mechanical <coughs> framework of phase space. Now, uh, I, I, although, although phase space is, is, appears in, in, in probably all of you have learned about it in your classical mechanics courses and so forth, I don't think I've heard it mentioned in any of the talks until now at this, at this meeting, and so I want to make sure that we're all on the same page with this. If you, if you write the classical, if you view the Hamiltonian as a function uh, of, of momentum and position, and here's my kinetic energy, here's my potential energy, and, uh, and, and if, at, at a fixed energy. And for the harmonic oscillator, I have this quadratic form for the potential, and this is actually the equation for an ellipse, right? p squared and x squared. And this is a contour of equal energy. Um, uh, and when you make a plot, a two-dimensional plot, of, moment, uh, of something in, in the momentum position plane, that's the, that's the phase space. So the harmonic oscillator the phase the equal energy contours have this elliptical uh, structure. The nice thing is that at lower energies, you sim there's simply ellipses with, with smaller uh, uh, radii. And at higher energies, there, there are ellipses with larger radii. And you can see that what's nice about looking at the phase space classically is that it gives you a picture of the entire structure of the dynamics and not just one particular trajectory. If we think about the Coulomb problem, all right, so we, we get out of this Hamiltonian, but the potential now has the minus one over x character. And then the, uh, an equal energy, typical equal energy contour for, uh, for the Coulomb problem looks something like this. Now, it, it, because of the long-range Coulomb attraction, uh, it, these, these contours uh, get very, very slowly as you go out. And, but at very, at very small uh, values of, of x, the, uh, you, you have this infinitely deep potential, and therefore, at, at, at fixed energy, you can get to infinitely high momentum. 
So you have these, these fingers that go out to very long X and very high uh, P. Okay. Now we want to take advantage of this underlying classical uh, phase space structure. And we're going to use an, an idea that goes back to uh, von Neumann in, in 1931. And that is uh, to, to take the, the phase space position momentum and divide it up into cells, where every cell has area of Planck's constant. And then von Neumann had the idea of, of a basis set where you put down in each phase space cell a Gaussian. Now, the Gaussian, the, the, the centers of the Gaussian are, shift, are in the basis are shifted over by, by an amount A. So here, here's the form of the Gaussian, e to the minus alpha, x minus and a. So the <coughs> Gaussian has this shift, n is an integer, it was shifted by an amount a. And then, but the Gaussian is in phase space, not just in coordinate space. So it's also shifted by, uh, by h, l is an integer, h over a is the shift in, in momentum. So you're spanning a, a, a two-dimensional, you have a two-dimensional parameter space here. Uh, where you're, that you're covering the phase space with this basis of the Gaussians. Now, just a couple of comments about a Gaussian basis set. Uh, it has the advantage that it's phase space localized. But there's something that you need to know about it, which is that it's a non-orthogonal basis. In other words, that you can see even visually that there's an overlap between neighboring Gaussians. And if it's a non-orthogonal basis, there are some subtleties in using this as a, as a basis set. But one of the things that's attractive, but Neumann himself didn't prove this, but it was proved in the 1970s by mathematical physicists, that this basis is a complete basis, but not overcomplete. So one Gaussian of the right dimensions per phase space cell of Planck's constant is a complete, but not overcomplete basis. And that's, that's very important for us. Now, uh, in 1979, Davis and Heller uh, had the following idea. Let me go back for a second. They have the following idea. If I can put down Gaussian, if I, if I think about the classical structure, there's a correspondence principle between classical and quantum mechanics. So if I think about this underlying classical structure, if I'm only interested in, in solving, the, if I'm interested in solving the time-independent Schrodinger equation for, to, get the eigen, to get the eigenstates up to energy E, then I shouldn't need to put Gaussians out here where the energy is much higher. I should only need to put my Gaussian basis functions where they're needed based on the classical mechanics. And therefore, I can save all of this uh, putting in basis functions in all of these areas. So that was their idea. <coughs> and, uh, and, and they did that. They built the Hamiltonian matrix. So here are these Gaussians as the, as the, uh, the basis functions. And here's the uh, kinetic and potential uh, function. And because it's a non-orthogonal basis, you have to you have to construct the overlap matrix of the Gaussian, and they did all that and so forth. And they covered just the part of the face, the classical phase space that they thought they needed. And they got very they got results that were very poorly convergent. Uh, and in fact, even when they filled the entire phase space, the results were contained uh, very large errors. And this this remained as a puzzle. Uh, uh, in, the, in the literature. And uh, this started with, our, our work in this started with uh, Tobias Brixner in a completely different context, and that's, that's not going to be part of today's talk, but it was on representing shaped femtosecond pulses using a time frequency representation. And when we did that, what we discovered is that we got terrible convergence with these Gaussians in phase space uh, just the way Davis and Heller got terrible convergence. But we found that if you make the Gaussian basis set periodic, both in, uh, in, in time and in frequency, or, or in the case of quantum mechanics, position and momentum, then the basis set uh, has, it converges exactly the same way that the Fourier basis converges. And, uh, and, and uh, so formally, this is the central equation of this entire talk. The, these uh, theta functions are the underlying basis functions of the Fourier method, which are periodic sync functions. 
And the Gaussian basis functions, instead of coming in as the basis, they come in as the coefficients of these periodic sink functions to, de to determine a new basis g tilde. So this becomes the new basis. And this looks like a terrible basis to work with, but luckily, all the tildes have disappeared from our working equations. I'm not going to walk you through the, the, the working equations, but all the tildes disappear, and all we ever have to do is work with the Gaussian basis sampled at the Fourier points. I want to make one other comment about this, which is that uh, this doesn't have to be based on Fourier. We, we've, we've used this now with Legendre's and with Laguerre's. These are called cardinal functions. I go to one at one point, and then go to zero at all the other points. So, so, so this is much more general, and these don't have to be Gaussian. So this is, a, this is more of a philosophy than an equation. Okay. Let me just show you something to, yeah. So is this different than a DVR? The thetas are the DVR functions. But, but the problem with the DVR is that if I think in phase space, what a DVR function does is it gives me a strip which, which, which fills the entire, uh, an entire line in momentum space. And so if you, and if you, uh, uh, if you, if you use a uh, Fourier representation, then you, then you have all coordinates. And this allows you to, to have a compromise, which allows you, in, in the limit that, that, the, that the size of these Gaussians is relatively small compared to the boundaries of the phase space, you, you, you have much more flexibility and much more savings. So this is to show you the remarkable uh, effect on convergence of these periodic boundary conditions. This is the von Neumann basis without the periodic boundary conditions. This is the log of the error as a function of increasing the number of basis functions using a, a rectangular geometry. Uh, and, and you can increase and increase the number of basis functions, the size of that rectangle, and you, you essentially never converge with the binomial. But if you use periodic boundary conditions, you converge like a rock. You get an exponential conversion. And, and uh, this is exactly the same convergence that you would get if you used the, uh, the fast Fourier method. For uh, which many people in the room, I think, have used for both quantum static calculations and quantum dynamics <coughs> calculations. So what we have now is a method which has Fourier accuracy but Gaussian flexibility. Now there's one other trick, and again, I'm not going to all the de all the theoretical details because this is kind of a mixed uh, audience. But but I want to there's. It turns out that the Ga Gaussian basis set, or even this Gaussian basis set that with the periodic boundary conditions, in a certain sense is the worst possible basis. And let me explain what I mean by that. If we keep the full number of basis functions to span the entire uh, rectangle in phase space, and then, and then, uh, and then we, we, we use the Fourier method, we start to remove Fourier functions, this is the logarithm of the error, you see that the error increases, but it increases kind of gradually. If you use these periodic Gaussians and you start and you remove even one basis function, your error is, is enormous. So the Gaussians, in a sense, are the worst possible basis because removing even one of them gives you a tremendous error. But if we do something, the B here stands for biorthogonal exchange. If you interchange, because the Gaussians are non orthogonal basis, <coughs> The, the relationships for, for, the, um, uh, for unity and so forth involve something called the biorthogonal basis. And if you, uh, what happens is that if, if the Gaussians are, are the basis, then the biorthogonal functions come into the coefficients. And that turns out to be the worst possible choice of what to do. If you, if you, if you, uh, if you want to get the benefit of this Gaussian basis, you want the Gaussians to be in the coefficients and the biorthogonal functions to be the basis. And these are terrible. And if anybody wants, I'll show you at the end a picture. These are the most ugly looking functions in the world. But they're the biorthogonals of the Gaussians, which give you these localized coefficients, which means you can throw away, in this case, for this, for this model, about 80% of the basis.